So, you probably know this thing on the map on the board here. We can talk a bit about different Buddhist traditions, crash course on Buddhist history and traditions or whatever. Um, and you might have some, I'm sure, preconceived ideas about, about Buddhism. And, you know, you know, you've heard, of, of course, you've heard of the Dalai Lama, Tibetan Buddhism. Um, there was two, two major schools historically, um, which is uh, it's right behind my head, Theravada and Mahayana, and then there's a third one, Vajrayana. Um, so I'll just describe a bit about their, the, them generally and their beliefs and a bit about how the sort of history behind them. Um, I, I'm a Theravadan Buddhist. I'm with the, the Thai forest tradition. So Theravada Buddhism, I've got it down here. This is Sri Lanka here. This is Burma, according to my map. And this is uh, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. So that's the, basically the indigenous Theravada in the world, about 100 million people. So Thera means elders, meaning uh, the Buddha's original monks, when the Buddha died, they, his senior monks, 500 enlightened arahants, fully enlightened, got together for three months, and they agreed upon 84,000 lines of his teachings. So the Theravada school adheres to these 84,000 lines, which is about uh, 6,000 pages on the reading list I gave you. You get them all from Wisdom Publications in Boston the suttas, all translated into English. And, and Vada means uh, word of the elders or way of the elders. So Theravada basically means a tradition that sticks to uh, the original teachings of, of the Buddha. So we're the only Buddhist tradition in the world that has that view, that sticks to Buddha's teachings as the ultimate highest authority in the religion. To us it makes common sense, but we're the only ones, which I'll have to explain later. <clears throat> and then uh, Mahayana, uh, maha means higher, yana means wheel, like the Buddha's teachings is compared to a wheel with the Eightfold Path. Right? I guess you knew that, right? I mentioned that before, the Eightfold Path. is The wheel is probably the most common symbol in, in Buddhism. It's interesting, in the Buddha's lifetime, there weren't that many symbols. There was the wheel for the Eightfold Path, and there was the monk's robes and the bowl. <laughs> I think that's about it for actual symbols. Um, so Mahayana is, is uh, geographically, it's everything north of Burma, like uh, Tibet, China, Japan, Mongolia, parts of Russia, maybe Poland as well. For, for Monica, uh, no, I don't think Poland's a bit more Catholic. Um, but Russia, Russia for many centuries, uh, Siberia has had some of this Vajrayana, Mahayana tradition. Uh, Japan, Korea, and even down the coast, uh, Vietnam is actually Mahayana, even though it's so close to Thailand. Vietnam, the influence came down from from China. So it's bigger, I'd say 60% of the Buddhist world may be something like 350 million Buddhists in total. Of course, that includes nominal Buddhists, so how do we know, but maybe something like 200 million, something like that, in the Mahayana. Um, and then uh, Vajrayana is kind of the pride of Tibetan Buddhism. It's not just in Tibet, it's also parts of China. Vajra means diamond-like or indestructible. And Yan again means wheel, so in their view, it's the third wheel of Buddha's teachings. Because they would regard Theravada, or the first wheel, as the Hinayana, I mean little wheel. So you get these wheels, little wheel, big wheel, bigger wheel. <laughs> so the Buddha would, they say the Buddha, he turned the wheel of Dharma, so he's, his arm is getting pretty tired at the second time, third time. You know, so this is, this is the image. Anyways, um... So uh, what do they believe? What's the differences? A lot of similarities, of course. Some, some important differences. Um, uh, well, Theravada, I would say, of course, I'm, you're going to think I'm biased, is uh, the purest form of Buddhism, the real, true teachings of Buddhism. Uh, but I would say there's really no controversy among scholars all over the world that Theravada is the closest to the original form of Buddhism, least change form of Buddhism. They stick to the, the suttas, the Pali... Pali Suttas. So what is the, the view and the goal of the Theravada? The view is to um, uh, follow the Arahant ideal. So Arahant, this is a, a fully enlightened person. Man, woman, or child in some cases. So the purpose of your life, to give you finally the last course tonight at the four class, give your money's worth. Purpose of your life is to become an Arahant. Yay! But if you don't do it in this lifetime, well, you know, you can work up to this four stages of enlightenment. Um, so that's the Arahant ideal. So the, 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 the view is to follow the Eightfold Path, the Buddhist teachings. The goal is to get enlightened, make it to Nibbana. We would say Nibbana, and Mahayana, they say Nirvana. It's just this translation of Pali versus Sanskrit languages, same thing. 
Yeah, so that's pretty straightforward. So the Mahayana has a different view and a different goal. Woo! Now what? Oh! Uh, the view of the Mahayana is the um, Bodhisattva ideal. Actually, the longer version of this course you can uh, get on my, my YouTube video called, I didn't tell you earlier, it's called The Taboo History of Buddhism 1 and 2. It's about 40 minutes long. It's getting a lot of hits at about 600 right now. Um, uh, so in a sense, this is uh, what I'm describing. Particularly the first thousand years of history is perhaps the biggest taboo in the religion. Not discussed in polite company. <laughs> or um, <laughs> discussed amongst insiders within traditions. Uh, I should point out, though, Buddhism has no history of uh, real conflicts over this. Like, there's no, never been a religious war in Buddhist history. Compared that to other religions, it's a pretty, pretty good uh, record. But there's differences of view. So the the view and the goal, the Mahayan, is the Bodhisattva ideal. And the Bodhisattva ideal is um, a teaching that you should forgo your own enlightenment in favor of the enlightenment of others. So you should work for the enlightenment of others, put others first, and uh, help them along their spiritual path, and deliver everyone to enlightenment until you yourself are the last one to jump over the line and get <laughs> enlightened. So it's very altruistic. Ideal and the highest value in Mahayana Buddhism is compassion, right? I'm sure you've seen Dalai Lama videos. He talks about compassion and kindness and kindness, compassion. Whereas the highest value in Theravada Buddhism is, can you guess? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's happiness. Happiness is the highest ideal. So the Buddha describes nirvana as the highest bliss, the highest happiness. So that's the highest value, to be happy. And I should point out, before you think we're all narcissistic, selfish people, um, <laughs> if you ever been around someone who's like really happy, it makes you happy just to be around them, right? So the happier you are, the happier you can make other people. Um, but so the Mahayana, the highest value is, is compassion. So it's an altruistic kind of a deal. So carrying on this, this Bodhisattva ideal, I actually took the Bodhisattva ideal back in um, 1991 because what you do not realize must not be told <laughs> is that I was the Mahayana Buddhist to begin with. I started off um, as a Tibetan Buddhist with the uh, Shambhala Center in Vancouver. And it was a wonderful period in my life, my first two years, you know, my honeymoon phase with Buddhism. So I took the, the Bodhisattva ideal. Um, and then years later, I joined, I've been with Ashton for 11 years now. He said to me, um, uh, I advise you to renounce it. Renounce the vow. <laughs> so I renounced the vow. He even said, Brian, in these classes that you teach there in Vancouver, you can ask people, you know, if any of them have ever taken the Bodhisattva vow. Some people go to a meeting or retreat, they take the vow, I'm not too sure what they're doing. So if any of you have taken the Bodhisattva vow, I advise you to renounce the vow. <laughs> I'll have to explain that as well. So, um, different view, different goal. So the Bodhisattva ideal, and the goal is actually a different goal because, um, uh, their nirvana is, is different than our nirvana, which is a, a strange thing to say. Uh, uh, I guess, put it in simple terms, um, back to the, um, the, the graph of the realms of existence, um, the Buddha taught that nirvana completely transcends samsara, right? And back to the pie graph, here's nirvana. So samsara, this term here, see samsara, means basically all the five realms of existence, all the cycle, even heaven and hell and human. It's all part of cyclic existence. So the goal is to get off the wheel of life, right, and make it to nirvana. So nirvana is separate from, transcends, it's beyond samsara from therapy, Theravada view. So a great essay about this you should read on my website by the legendary Bhikkhu Bodhi, her greatest scholar monk. He's actually... Um, an American monk, I've been a monk for about 42 years, he said um, uh, the, the view of nirvana and samsara in the Mahayana Buddhism, which is from a Theravada view, outrageous. This is the idea that nirvana and samsara are inseparable. They're kind of a one, oneness, that attaining enlightenment, being in nirvana is intermingled, inseparable from samsara. So from a Theravada view, this contradicts uh, what the Buddha taught. <laughs> So the concept of nir uh, nirvana is, is different. might not affect your meditation practice too much. 
but it, it is a, it's a different goal. So this is a Mahayana teaching on, on emptiness and non-duality. Uh, the Buddha didn't teach non-duality. You can, there's lots of literature on this, and Vaita Vedanta is really into non-duality. Like the Hindu school of Vaita Vedanta is actually started around 1000 AD. It was based upon Mahayana Buddhism, uh, a school which really developed by around 480, this idea of non-duality. So the Hindu non-duality and Zen and Tibetan non-duality is really close in bed with each other, but the, the Theravadans uh, don't agree with this view. <laughs> so, what I'm, you, so what I'm saying is, um, say, Tibetan and Zen is a bit closer to Hindu Advaita Vedanta than actually to what the Buddha taught. So this is getting complicated. Um, so I guess to really give your money's worth, uh, uh, the point is um, you should investigate a bit of Buddhist history. Uh, back in 1991 when I started, they did, there was no Google. I couldn't Google Buddhist history. And I didn't know, right? I just, and it became one of the biggest issues in my spiritual life. <laughs> After about two years, I moved to Thailand and checked out, you know, Buddhist history in the Thai tradition, Theravada, because I was a Tibetan Buddhist, and, and oh, I realized I've been misled, I had it wrong, um, the, I was misled about history, and oh, it was a big deal until about 1998. <laughs> so when I wrote Freeing the Buddha in, um, wrote in 1999, one of the themes was my own personal uh, uh, study of Buddhist history, getting it right, you know, starting off the right foot. So I want to save you about seven, eight years of your time here. <laughs> But now, just if, so of course, I'm saying you know should, you should investigate this for yourself if you have an interest, of course, and don't take my word for anything. You just Google Buddhist history; it will be right there. The splits, the schisms, the rise of Mahayana this developed. And uh, but if you're with a particular tradition, um, you wouldn't really know unless you go to the library or go online and dig things up. Um, mo most traditions, like in other religions, have their version of history, right? Mm -hmm. Their version of what happened. <laughs> so it's. It's um, disparate views within Buddhist tradition. So as long as you know that, then you can have some sense of asking the question, well, what did the Buddha teach? What are the real teachings of the Buddha? So if you have that question in mind, well, you'll, you'll get to the Pali, Pali Sutra, so I should write that down. So, so the Theravada teachings are based upon, so Pali is the language is written on, and suttas, that's the Pali term for, it literally translates from the mouth of the Buddha, an actual discourse of the Buddha. Yeah, there's thousands of them. Yeah, so so um, a different view, different goal, goal bodhisattva ideal. Um, and then the Vajrayana, just explain that. It's um, like, for instance, the, the Dalai Lama, they teach what is called the three-yana approach. Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. It's all part of like stages of the path, like beginning, intermediate, and advanced. Um, so Vajrayana began around uh, 600 A.D., and Mahayana began around 50 BC, uh, where the Buddha lived, you know, around 5th century uh, BC. They, Richard Gombrich is actually perhaps one of the greatest uh, living Buddhist historians today. He estimates the lifespan of the Buddha is about 485 BC to 405 BC, he lived for 80 years. So any books on Richard Gombrich, I'd certainly uh, recommend, there's, there's a lot of them. So Vajrayana is interesting. Um, this is Tibetan Buddhism, which is the most popular in, in the West, partly because of the diaspora of the Tibetan people since 1959, so they spread around. And Tibetans learned uh, English. They went to India, and they learned English, and they came to America and Europe. Whereas, like, Thailand, the uh, population of Thai, Thailand is ten times bigger than Tibet, right? Tibet's only six million people. But the Thais are quite comfortable with their own independent kingdom for a thousand years, so they're not really motivated to come to America and learn English and <laughs> spread the word. So, so Tibetans have been quite, quite successful. So what, what's the Vajrayana about? Well, it's kind of a combination of things. You call it the <laughs> term syn syncretic, means a mixture. It's a mixture of Mahayana Buddhism with some, some Hindu ideas. A lot of their uh, deities and chants and practices are like copycat with the Hindus, Hindus copy the Tibetans, Tibetans copy the Hindus. If you're in Nepal, you know, you go into a Tibetan Buddhist temple, walk across the street to a Hindu temple, you can't even tell the difference. <laughs> Was that Hindu? Was that Tibetan Buddhist? So it borrows a lot from Hinduism. Also, the pre-existing religion in Tibet prior to Buddhism arrived rather late, about 7th century AD. Uh, the Bon was the B-O-N. Bon was the previous religion, which is a shamanic, shamanism, animistic, 
uh, type of religion. So what uniquely happened in Tibet is they, the, the Bon priests got it kind of subsumed within the hierarchy of Tibetan Buddhism. So Tibetan Buddhism combines some of the sh- shamanic magical, so Tibetan has this kind of magical you know, channeling. And, and uh, quite a bit uh, of working with deities. It's the term Tantra, taken from Hinduism, Tantra means um, working with deities or working with energies. So some of the practices are, are quite, uh, quite far out and quite, um, I guess, not accepted by the Theravada school. Uh, but some of the, the breath meditation, like when I was first taught, was fine. I mean, they do a technique, say the Shambhala Center, where you, you're following the breath, you're following the out-breath, the impact just happened to snatch you, fall the out breath, you labor your thoughts sinking. I mean, it's fine, another variation. Um, um, so some Tibetans have adapted themselves more to sort of American thinking. But um, it's a real mixed bag in Tibetan Buddhism. A lot of other things uh, that go with it, like 100,000, uh, they do practices called uh, prostration, 100,000 prostrations to 108 a day, and you do this for three years. Count it, like 108. What's 100,000? 108,000. It's 1,000 days. What's 1,000? That's three years, right? So they, I, I lived in a Tibetan bus center, Karma Chilling in Vermont, and downstairs you hear people going thunk, you know, thunk, <laughs> full length prostrations. You do that for three years. And after that, you do uh, three years of mantra, three years of mandala, and three years of guru yoga. So it's long practices. Uh, and maybe there's some value to it, you know, but. Uh, the Buddha didn't teach those practices. And a lot of it's based on uh, devotion to the guru. You see a picture of your guru, or you visualize your guru. Actually, I've got a picture of Brian Rue here in my wallet. So I'll stick it up here, and I want you to have devotion for Brian Rue's photo here. Go home and do this practice for three years. So you wonder, why, why do you do this? So it's complex, a lot of different practices. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, so getting back on why would I recommend you renounce the Bodhisattva ideal? We had um, Zongzar Kinsey Rinpoche, he was here years ago, had hundreds of people meeting in Rich- Richmond, taking the Bodhisattva vow. It's a big deal, advertised, you pay quite a bit of money for this weekend retreat. Take the Bodhisattva vow. <laughs> um, well, the, the problem with it, according to my tradition, is uh, you're taking a vow not to get enlightened. You're taking a vow to forgo your own enlightenment and help others. Sounds nice, but you know, it's just causing you to have a lot more suffering for thousands of years. You're gonna, you promise actually after your death, part of the vow is you're going to come back to human birth to keep helping others. <laughs> so you keep helping others and you keep coming back. So it really prolongs your time in samsara, perpetual rebirth. So the Theravada view is the Arhant Ar- ideal. You should make efforts towards your own enlightenment. And when you do get enlightened, um, in that last lifetime, you can do probably a lot more to help others in that last lifetime than you sort of pop off to nirvana. So what happened over the centuries is some people got upset that when, um, when someone attains enlightenment, they're never coming back, which is true. Technically, it's not possible for an enlightened person to take rebirth. So some people felt kind of hurt by that and kind of abandoned. <laughs> you know, you're just going to leave us? Like, mom's just going to abandon the children? So... So somebody invented this idea, the, the Bodhisattva ideal, you know, you keep coming back. And, but uh, within the Mahayana school, they had kind of a technical problem because, you know, the Theravadans, are, they're getting enlightened, right? They're, they're producing arons, they're getting enlightened. But if we're coming back, we're not enlightened. They, they're enlightened, we're not, so that's not good. So they changed the laws of the universe somewhere around, oh, first century AD. And Mahayana decided that, um, well, um, well you, you, can, like, you, can, you can get enlightened, right? and be as a bodhisattva, and after you die, you can still come back because, because you've got so much compassion. <laughs> you've got so, somehow you can do it. So they defy the laws of physics. Uh, so they say, well, they're enlightened bodhisattvas. They get people, you know, they get enlightened and they come back. And it's common for de- Tibetans to feel that their guru, you know, was, was enlightened and came back, enlightened and came back. And yeah, so that's how they kind of get over that loophole. And Zen? Oh yeah, Zen. Well, Zen is within the Mahayana school. It, it arose in uh, China around uh, 520 AD with the Bodhidharma who came from India. No one's really sure what his tradition was. Um, so he was uh, a bit disillusioned with uh, Pure Land, which is very sort of ostentatious and grandiloquent 
uh, temples. So Zen has an emphasis on, uh, on sitting meditation, a direct experience, and kind of a, a renouncing of the, the fancy uh, temples and the statues and all of that. So a lot of Zen centers, they don't even have a statue of the Buddha. It's very simplified. So the emphasis uh, is on sitting. Like, say, the Japanese tea ceremony, or the Chinese tea, this simplicity. So it actually uh, came from China. The Chinese word is chan, C-H, apostrophe A-N. And then when it went into Japan, just the Japanese word for chan is Zen. So emphasis. It still has a, a Mahayana worldview about things like uh, you know, samsara and nirvana and inseparable and non-duality and things. But uh, I guess the meditation practice is closer to the Theravada. School. So Theravada and Zen, a lot of groups uh, even combine a bit of Theravada and Zen in terms of practice. Um, Pure Land, I should mention, because you're, you're going to the big Ch- Chinese temple where I used to work in 1997. Oh, so Pure Land is, um, um, the scholars aren't quite sure how it arose, but around the 2nd century AD is a fascinating change in history. Um, in Kashmir, India, there was a, a Buddhist king by the name of Kushana. Well, the king himself wasn't a Buddhist, but Kushana ruled over Kashmir, Afghanistan, and Iran. And Iran was the center of the Zoroastrian religion where they had the sun god worship. And so that's one theory of how Pure Land came about. Because in Pure Land, they worship Amitabha Buddha, which is a cosmic Buddha of infinite light and everlasting length of life. So in Pure Land, they, they worship this, this cosmic Buddha and actually chant I was on BCTV News in 1997 because uh, doing this chant, walking meditation, because uh, Brad Pitt had the movie Seven Years in Tibet. So they wanted to go to a Buddhist temple film something. So I was their public relations official. So they had this filming. We're going, um, So it is a, a worship religion. And the W word we don't really have in Theravada tradition. Like we don't worship. In Buddhism, but in Pure Land, they, they do worship. But another theory of how it came about is um, it might have been indigenous um, influences in India, within Mayan Buddhism in, in India, or a combination of other influences. But somehow, they invented Amitabha Buddha, which does not exist in the Theravada view. And so I've been to the other one on the number five road in Richmond, it's the biggest one in Canada now. When I worked at the one at Stevenson Highway in, in Richmond, it was the largest Buddhist temple in Canada. So the back of my paper, I put, Brian Root teaches the largest Buddhist temple in Canada. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was at the one just a few months ago in number five row in Richmond. We're all standing there, chanting Amitabha, maybe, you know, about 50 or 60 Chinese. And then we all, like, bow to the ground, stand up, and you're reading some more, chant, 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 bow. It's very alien to what the Buddha taught. Yeah, so um, we would say Pure Land is one of the furthest away from, from Buddhism. Uh, Tibetan has more sophistication. La- Lama Sura Das, a famous American Tibetan Lama, he was here years ago. And I think I asked him about the Pure Land. He said, well, this is what he said. He said, well, at least they're not doing something else with their hands. So it shows the disdain the Tibetans have for the Pure Land. They're both forms of Mahayana. And it's nothing political about Tibet and China. It's a, uh, it's a very simplistic uh, worship type religion. They teach you know when when you die, then Amitabha will come to your death, deathbed and you chant his name with faith and devotion. He'll take you to his pure land in the West, somewhere in space, millions of miles in space, and you'll be reborn. This pure land called Sukhavati, and you'll be reborn in a lotus flower. And when that lotus flower blooms, you will attain enlightenment. So it's, it's quite far out, and somebody invented this in the 2nd century AD in Kashmir. So um, the principle to understand, though, if two religions have an amicable relationship, whether it's you know, Zoroastrian and Mahayana Buddhism or Mahayana something else, then often people will invent a hybrid, right? You see that in our culture, hybrids all the time, right? Yoga and meditation retreats, this and that. Uh, so people invent hybrids. So um, it might have been the Iranian sun god, which became Amitabha Buddha. Uh, Edward Kanza was a great uh, British Buddhist historian back in the 1950s. His view is it came from uh, uh, the Zoroastrian religion, but uh, other historians today, some disagree, some have other theories. No one really knows. <laughs> but the point is, it's not, it's not Buddhism. So we regard it as a, it's another religion. It's another religion. 
See, the problem is, you know, we didn't retain the copyright back in the fifth century BC on, to, on Buddhism. We didn't copyright the B word that we own Buddhism. Just anybody can call anything they want Buddhism, you know? Oh, gosh. Then there's the Nichiren sect in, from Japan, which is here in, 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 in Vancouver as well, called Sugaka Genkai. 50 million people in Japan. It was invented 1300 AD in Japan by this monk called Nichiren. And they, they chant the name of the Lotus Sutra. They chant, um, what do they chant? chant ne, they chant Nam Go Renge Ho, Nam Go Renge Ho, Nam Go Renge Ho. If you walk into their, their temple on Marine Drive, it can be, and I've done this for a tour, like 100 people chanting Nam Go Renge Ho. It has almost nothing to do with Buddhism. I mean, it's, maybe it's good, it's a form of concentration, chanting, calms your mind. I'd say there's nothing wrong with it. It'd be better if they didn't call it Buddhism. But millions and zillions of people. <laughs> And they call it Orthodox Buddhism. So, so, so if you're not have if you're not educated about the difference, it's hard like, in the West cities like Vancouver and other everywhere else. Every single Buddhist tradition in the world is in one place, in one city like Vancouver, New York, Chicago. So if you're new at this, oh boy, you know, who knows what's going to happen to you, right? So my concern, <laughs> what's going to happen to you after you know 50 minutes from now? Well, I, I was five minutes late. Okay, what's going to happen to you at five minutes after nine tonight? You know. So if you have any interest in Buddhism, ah, you know, I have, I have compassion for you. So, so I want to give you money's worth, give you a heads up, so you can do your own digging and research. People have said to me, well, why don't people just go to whatever tradition they feel is right for them, you know? What do you feel is right for you? But what about truth, huh? What about the Buddha, huh? What about what the Buddha taught, what he wanted you to... What about history? Not just how you feel, right? <laughs> uh. Um, but the good news, I think, is we still have the Buddhist teachings that are extant after 25 centuries. We still have the hopeful entire Pali Suttas, you know, translated in English, and uh, the future is still uh, hopeful, you know. You can still find it. And within Mahayana, there's still a lot of good practice going on as well. And I think there's a bit less, uh, perhaps, arrogance between the schools, because they're, they're, we used to be geographically separated for centuries, right? Like, down here and up there. But now we're together, there's some uh, connections and stuff, so people are a bit more polite, I guess, in their relationship or, or discourse. Because um, I guess one of the disadvantages that the Mahayana have is um, they call themselves the higher wheel, they're the big wheel, and they call the Theravada the, the Hinayana, which is, translates usually as lesser wheel, but it's actually the real translation, a bit less polite than that. <laughs> so it's meant to be a derogatory term. So it's, um, in order just to be a Mahayana, you've got to have a Hinayana. I mean, in order for you to be higher, somebody's got to be lower than you. So the very fabric, fundamental fabric of their scriptures is that they're higher than the Theravada and they're lower. So it's, uh, within the, you know, fundamental Theravada teachings, the Mahayana didn't exist, right? No reference to it. It didn't exist till 5th century BC. So it's kind of hard for them to, to balance that. So they have to be superior because they're the higher wheel. So it is definitely in their, their literature and their teachings that the Hinayana is lower, you know, elementary school. I mean, got Brian Rue at the West Side Community Center. Well, that's just Hinayana, right? You want the higher teachings. Go to big, also, what do people want to think? There's a big Chinese temple in Richmond, two of them, right? Huge things, well organized, zillions of dollars. They, they must be advanced, right? Then, you know, meeting room number two at the West End Community Center with four people in Brian Rue's class. So what are you going to think, right? Um, <laughs> that's why I like to support the, the Theravada Forest tradition. At least it's the larger, largest organization actually in the world of uh, Westerners. Do they have schools? Hmm? Do they have schools like the Mayana? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, even uh, <laughs> Theravada has schools like in Thailand. They have uh, Buddhist schools, even for kids, high school students. Uh, Buddhist universities. Uh, you mean it's my hand to have Buddhist schools here, you mean? Uh, I guess uh, I've been to, uh, there's the Golden Buddhist Monastery in Main Street and 11th. It's another Pure Land temple. What's nice about them is they gave us the land for our monastery near San Francisco, um, by Aguirre, which is very generous of them, right? Zillions of dollars of land. Because um, their master Ho and his will, when he died, he left it to us. So we're, we're pretty chummy with them. And I've been there, uh, the Sunday school for the kids. 
with all these Chinese kids and the Chinese teacher, and they were teaching in English because a lot of the Chinese kids, most of them spoke English. Yeah. So that, yeah, they have some level of organization, certainly. Okay, hey, I've been lecturing too long. We should have some questions and discussions. So did I cover everything? Of course, this is just a thumbnail sketch. <laughs> the Mahayana says, say about the Theravada, that just they are the lower... Well, I mean, it, it depends who you talk to. You don't say different things. Uh, I guess the fish according to their, their scriptures, right? Yeah, the Theravada is the Hinayana, the, the lower teaching. So they would say that the Theravada is the teachings of the Buddha. No dispute. They say, yes, it is. And, and the Buddha, in his wisdom, he gave these, these elementary teachings for people with blunt faculties, what they actually say in the scriptures. Um, uh, so, but but uh, if, if you talk to Mayana, so I've talked to them often. I remember when I was a Tibetan Buddhist in Vermont, I was going to go to Nepal, that was my plan. But they said, no, I'll go to Thailand first, do some retreats there for a couple of months. And they recommended Ajahn Buddha Dasa, you know. He said he's like the Chogam Champa of, of Thailand, who was our, our guru at that time, Tibetan master. So they were quite favorable about Thailand and Thai practice. In, in practical terms, they thought it was good. So a lot of the people would would, uh, would even go to Theravadan temples and retreats, and a lot of people would go back and forth. Or I know a, a Theravadan Buddhist student of mine, he, he married a Tibetan Buddhist woman, you know, things going fine with them. They go to trips to Nepal together, then they go on Theravadan retreats together. So. But I should, should mention in terms of the scriptures of the Mahayana, um, after they were founded in 50 BC, in order to, I guess, justify themselves, they wrote new and approved discourses of the Buddha. So we have about uh, 6,000 pages of the Pali Sutras. Then they wrote uh, Mahayana Sutras. They use an R, Sutras. So that's just a Sanskrit spelling. So if you ever see Sutras, that should be a red flag hole. So from, for about a period of 800 years, they wrote over 10 to 15,000 pages of brand new discourse of the Buddha. So these are regarded as uh, counterfeit discourses of the Buddha. Yeah, so I, yeah, so that's significant. Yeah, so I tell a funny story in my, my first book, Freeing the Buddha. There, I had a lawyer in, in my class, a chillman. And he said he, you know, he wants to go to source documents because he's a lawyer, so fine. So he went to Banyan Books, our spiritual bookstore here in Vancouver, to get the, uh, the Pali Suttas. He said, he went there, he said, could I have, please have the Pali Suttas? And the girl working there said, oh, um, ah, we're, we're out of them, you know. But well, we've got the, the Diamond Sutta, we've got the Flower Ornament Sutta. These are Mahayana Sutras, <laughs> big, huge texts. And he said, no, 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 thanks. So he left with cash in hand. And actually, the joke is they did have the Pali Sutras there. They're, they're locked under glass at the Long Discourse of Buddha, the Middle Lake Discourse of Buddha. But they don't sell them very often. The girl was just unfamiliar with them. <laughs> so she lost the sale. So the irony there, this is the real teachings of the Buddha. This lawyer wanted to buy the real teachings. And he, he, they didn't offer it to him. But they're offering him the counterfeit discourses, the Diamond Sutra, <laughs> Adam, Adam Masaka Sutra, the Lotus Sutra. These are famous sutras, but they're... And uh, people generally know um, they are not the discourse, but even like uh, Mahanas themselves, a lot of them know it's not the teaching of the Buddha, but a lot of them don't know. And they're, not, they're not actually taught that it's not. So the way they explain this, just to make a long story longer, um, they say, well, the Buddha in his wisdom, you know, he taught the Mahana discourses... Uh, during his lifetime on earth, but he taught them to the devas, the heavenly beings, and the devas recorded this. So as in the future, he could revivify the doctrine after it slipped, slipped into the decline. So after about four or five centuries, you know, when things were slipping into the decline, the devas, or, or the nagas, these are like, uh, you know, Loch Ness Monster, or Ogopogo, and Okanagan Lake. These, these are nagas from a Buddhist view. These are real type creatures. So they say, well, the nagas... I had the, hid the Mahayana teachings in subterranean caves underwater, you see. And then they were revealed to Nargarjuna, about 50 BC. He was a Mahayana saint, and uh, so they would be you know, revealed and made known to the world. So Nargarjuna 
you know, came upon these Mahayana sutras. So that's the official story, Mahayana generally in the world, uh, where the teachings came from, that they were channeled from, from devas who got it to the Buddha. So that means, you know, say you're, you're receiving something, you know, let's have a lot of, say you have a lot of caffeine in your coffee, and, hey, I'm receiving something, write it down, oh man. In fact, I even have a section in my book, a uh, uh, chapter called Changing Buddha's Words from 380 to page 389. It's really the most heavy, heavy information. There's a section called uh, How to Write a Sutra. So how you, in the comfort of your own home, can write a new and improved discourse to the Buddha. So say you have some political agenda, you know, you want to be a vegetarian, or say you want to protect the rights of animals or whales. You can write a sutra from the Buddha, a Mahayana Sutra. So... Uh, bit of uh, sarcasm there, of course. Yeah, so this went on and on. Then after around 8th eight, century AD, they just said, okay, we're going to stop this, you know, 50,000 pages, but I put a lid on this, but you know, got to keep uh, as believable as we can. Yeah, so it's interesting. If you compare, the, like, the Catholics to the Protestants, um, they have differences in views, but they have the same set of books, right? They have the same Bible. <laughs> Whereas the Theravadans and the Mayanas have a different set of books. <laughs> the Pali Sutras and the Mahayana Sutras. A totally different set of books. However, I have to give some credit to the Chinese. The Agamas is the Chinese translation of the, the Pali Sutras. So the Chinese have all of the Buddhist real teachings, all the Pali Sutras, translated in Chinese, called the Agamas. In fact, one Chinese woman, she was a regular student of mine about 10 years ago, and she found a Chinese temple here in Vancouver that actually follows the, the Agama, it's like a Theravadan Chinese tradition in their own language. But the Tibetans don't have, have that, that much, they don't have the Agamas. Yeah, so uh, it's a deliberately made to be obfuscated, <laughs> meaning this is difficult to figure out because they're trying to hide it from you, they're trying to make it difficult, they're trying to hide the truth from you. It's just like the New World Order conspiracy theories. <laughs> Woo! Oh, I gotta stop this. Gotta be normal with teacher someday. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm pretty light about this. When I discovered this around 1998, before I um, met Ash and so on, I felt kind of paranoid. Like, I'm the only Theravadan in the city that knows. You know, I'm the only one who knows the truth. <laughs> I felt kind of isolated. Then I met Ajahn, and sort of, of course, he knows all this stuff, and he took him into much more detail. In fact, the very first day I met him, he was giving a talk on this to a group of Laotians and Thais, Theravadan insiders, so he really kind of spilled the beans. So now I'm more relaxed about it, a bit more clinical, funny about it, you know. But, oh, in the late 1990s, I was really serious about this, you know. It's a big weight of the world on my shoulders, you know. It's like, you know, the early investigators into the the Kennedy assassination. They just said, oh my God, Lyndon Johnson was behind it. Oh my God. They feared for the life. Can't talk. But now I'm more relaxed. Hey, I could just, just laugh about it. So I want to save you years of anguish and <laughs> mental turmoil on your Buddhist path ahead of you. See, stop me. You should ask questions. Stop me from carrying on. So, um... I'll talk a bit about uh, Buddhist history. This is kind of an addendum video with my, my YouTube video on the subject since um, some parts maybe have been weren't complete. Since it's a big long subject, I talk, talk for two hours, I'll just give you some hits. But this is um, perhaps a... Uh, Buddhist greatest hits. Well, this is actually... Um, <laughs> this this uh, Pali scholar emailed me, I actually watched my YouTube video called, uh, you know, what is wrong with Buddhism? I said, Brian, you know, how can you joke around about, about something that you're dead serious about? So I'm going to try as much as my best but not to joke around here and just be straight. Because <laughs> this is perhaps the biggest taboo in the entire religion. This is something that's um, not really discussed, that, um, that uh, the Mahayana was not taught by the Buddha. The Theravada is regarded by scholars with, you know, without much debate about this. As the authentic, true teachings of the of the Buddha. So, most Theravadins are polite, and they don't discuss this outside of their own company. So, I was in some of these circles where they discuss this, and I've been picking this up for the last twenty years. And I was a Tibetan Buddhist in 1991, and I converted 
around 1993 when I found out this particular information I can tell you now. So I'd like to save you many years of confusion. In fact, some people on YouTube have emailed Brian, you saved me so much time from going through so many dead ends, these comments on YouTube. Really appreciate explaining the history. Other people on YouTube said this is the best history lesson on Buddhism I've ever seen anywhere on YouTube. It's probably not a lot of them. So anyways, um, uh, having built, built this up, um, so I'll describe um, you know, where, where does Buddhism come from. So the first five centuries particularly, there were some serious uh, splits. Like most religions, right? Most divide and split over views. And Buddhism's the same. However, <laughs> I'll preface my statements by saying there's never been any history of religious war in Buddhist history. That's good. Um, so... Um, We'll start with the Buddha's uh, death. The, the calendar, I should know the year today, uh, something like um, 2,570, something or whatever. And the Buddha's calendar basically goes from um, when they think the Buddha died. So that's called Buddhist era. So uh, 0 BE, this is when uh, the Buddha died. So that's really the beginning of the calendar, not at his birth or not his enlightenment, but when he dies. So he died at the age of 80, 0 BE. So the history at that point was um, everything was fine. The Buddha felt you know he could go. He was ready to go because uh, his, his teachings were in place. So after his death, they, um, the 500 enlightened arhats, these are fully enlightened monks and nuns, they decided to convene the first council. This was held three months after the Buddha's passing for the purpose of uh, ratifying the Buddha's teachings, agreeing upon what he taught, and also leaving out some repetitive teachings that weren't necessary, that... They agreed upon 84,000 lines, which is like 6,000 pages. They felt that was enough to preserve. So everybody was in agreement. Everything was fine. And things went on smoothly for a century. And Buddhism spread. Um, here's uh, my map of India here. So pretty much just in northeastern India. So um, in the first century, it started to spread out. So these were the golden days, the good old days of, of Buddhism. Thousands of enlightened arahats. Things were fine. And then there was a schism, which occurred um, about 100 years after the Buddha. I would describe this as a minor schism. I don't know the whole story. I think the scholars themselves don't quite understand it. It seems um, the problem is one side um, wanted to introduce more, more rules, because they have these 227 precepts for monks, plus hundreds of lesser rules. So one side said, well, we should be really good and disciplined and virtuous and add more rules. And the other side said, look, we got enough rules. We're virtuous enough. We don't need any more rules. And it seems scholars have different views. They don't seem to know for sure which side was which. So originally there was no sex. It was just the, the Dhamma, right? The Buddhist teachings of Dhamma. And you could call them the Terras. So Terra is a term. Basically just means elders. You know, the elders who, who carried on after the Buddha, senior monks. So that was fine. So then when, once they had the schism, they had to distinguish themselves, the terrorists, from the other guys. So the other group were called the uh, Mahasangikas. They called themselves that, which is um, this term here. So Maha is a term, basically means higher. Like ma Mahayana, they call themselves the higher wheel, big wheel. Yana means vehicle or wheel. So Sangika means, Sangha means community community monks and nuns, so they called themselves the Great Community. Okay, so um, so that was a first schism, but it wasn't really a, a big deal, apparently. They didn't change the Buddha's teachings um, about some rules, but the really big schism was 137 years after the Buddha. Um, some translations or texts say it was 116 years, it seems most scholars favor 137 years after the Buddha. It, it doesn't really matter. We're, we're dealing with ancient history here, but um, it's important to point that we, we do really know basically what happened every century. I knew uh, Professor A.K. A. Warder in Toronto. He was the head of uh, Buddhist studies at the University of Toronto. I met with him, and um, he wrote a quite a well-known, uh, quite reputable book called Indian Buddhism back in the 60s, you know, with all these schools of thought and all, all the splits. So it's very thoroughly studied. Um, just so you know, it's not like, oh, it's a big mystery. It's, it's, not that, it's just very complicated <laughs> if you want to read it. So what happened 137 years after the Buddha? Well, um, there was um, a schism led by Mahadeva. He's kind of the, the big bad guy in early Buddhist history. 
Um, so Mahadeva was a monk who um, he sort of tapped into the sediment within the Buddhist world. Um, some people didn't get along with the, the leadership, which is the arahants. Because Buddha said, you know, after I die, you know, the arahants, the fully enlightened ones, they're obviously the leaders of the community. Well, just like in normal human politics, right? Some people don't like <laughs> the leaders telling them that they're smarter than, <laughs> than you. So, um, so some people, you know, they, he tapped in the sediment. So he led a revolt against the, um, the arahants. In fact, one of the early sects at that time, the Samidya sect, they claimed that Mahadeva was the incarnation of Mara himself. So Mara is like the Buddhist uh, uh, Satan or the devil. He's uh, a deva, a heavenly being, lives in the sixth heaven. So Mara is the one that's trying to tempt you, basically prevent people from getting enlightened. According to the Sibidia sect, which was witnesses at the time, they were there. They said uh, Mara took, don, took form, human form, which is just possible according to the Buddhist teachings. He donned the robes of a monk and uh, he led the schism. <laughs> do I believe that? I don't know. Uh, not in there's other accounts. Did he do anything else, like kill anybody? Or? Not that I'm aware of, no. No? Okay. No, I wouldn't say so, no. No, I wouldn't say okay. he did that. But what he did, um, he tapped in the sediment and he, uh, he was a charismatic speaker. He led a revolt against the monks and he had a debate with the, with the Arhats. His revolt was against the Arhats, the enlightened ones. He said, they're not uh, really enlightened. They're not good enough. We shouldn't follow them. And I'll tell you why. He said, yeah, he proposes his five theses, famous five theses, I mean five things, he said, which were wrong, wrong with our hearts. First, he said, they're prone to having seminal emissions in their sleep, which is sperm. So Mahadeva, I'm not, I don't believe that he uh, checked the sheets of the monks to see if there was sperm in the sheets. Um, <laughs> But this is his act, which we in the Theravada school regard as a, a ludicrous kind of accusation to make. However, just to explain Mahadeva's statement, the Buddha did discuss this. The Buddha said, you know, if a monk has uh, seminal emissions in his sleep, then this is not an offense. It's not a problem. Of course, if a monk has seminal emissions you know, deliberately, then, oh, that's a sangha to cess. It's, a, it's not a disrobing offense, but it's close to that. You know, you've got to do a penance. But if it's in your sleep, the Buddha said, no, that's the way it is. It's okay, so it's not an offense. But Ma David's point was, well, these people, these guys are arhats, right? They're fully enlightened. They're having seminal emissions in their sleep. Therefore, he concluded, this means that they're prone to the effects of demonic spirits. Therefore, they can't really be enlightened. That's reason enough for a schism. <laughs> that's have a schism. So the, the second... Um, the second reason, he said, um, some of these arahants are prone to having nightmares, which again indicates that they're prone to the effects of demonic spirits, so therefore they can't be enlightened. And the other ones, he said, uh, so that was two. The other faults, he said, um, they're still subject to um, ha having doubts. They have doubts. They're fully enlightened. They've got doubts. Also, they're still ignorant of many things, and they're supposed to be enlightened. And also, they have to rely upon others for their salvation. So in these five, five counts, the arms are no good, so let's, let's leave. Come on, guys, let's quit. So then he led thousands of people off. So this was like a sub-schism within the Mahasangika. So the Mahasangika has already existed a few decades. So within the Mahasangika, uh, the Mahasangika themselves split into seven different schools of the Mahasangika. So Mahadeva, he did the big split. So... Um, this is quite serious because, uh, of course, getting back to the Buddha, you know, the Arhants are the leadership. So once you turn your back on the Arhants, the actual leaders, the enlightened beings, then uh, what Masagika, the Masagikas are doing is they're just sort of going through a, a forest without a trail. They're just getting lost. You know, where are they going? They're not following the enlightened leadership. They're paving their own path. So this has led to the problems that we have in um, Buddhism today and the schisms of different traditions. Today, one of the um, important decisions they made too was that the, the uh, they didn't regard the Pali Sutras of the Buddha as the <coughs> as the final last word. So the Pali Sutras, the actual discourse of the Buddha, Theravadins believe is a, is the highest authority in the religion. I mean, apparently, obviously to us, you know, the Buddha's words, like this right here, 
and all the other suttas, this is the highest authority in religion. But we are the only school in Buddhism today that has that view. <laughs> no other school in Buddhism has that view. So they were the first to open the door to the possibility, well, maybe the Buddha's inspiration could come to us in other ways. Maybe the Buddha could like, like manifest like a second coming. But the Buddha said that after he died, he said, uh, I will not be seen by gods and men. So we made it clear, there will be no visitations of the Buddha. No one's ever going to see the Buddha again. He's gone. <laughs> That's clear from the Theravada view. But the Mahasiddhika says, well, who knows? And maybe, uh, maybe the Buddha's teachings can channel down from the devas, because you know, the Buddha taught the heavenly beings. You know? And this is actually true. The Buddha taught the devas, heavenly beings. And it's actually true that devas could channel down from human beings. That, that itself is um, not an issue. So that's what happened with the Masagika. So then they carried on for a few centuries, um, maybe two or three centuries during that time. They, they divided a mention into seven schools. Seven different schools of Masagikas. But the Terras, they divided into 11 different schools. Like there's a Samidia sect in northern India and others. And the Savasti Vardens, various schools. They're all very similar and they all have the same Pali suit. There's no argument about the, the Buddhist discourses. And originally with the Masagikas, they didn't change the Buddhist discourses. They didn't tamper with that. So we all we saw the Pali suttas. So then you had all these various um, schools, and then uh, what happened next? What was the next big thing? The next big thing was, uh, you know, 50 BC was the rise of the Mahayana. So uh, this occurred within uh, several of the schools of the Mahasangikas. Um, Several people got together, monks, nuns, lay people, and they announced that uh, we have an, a new vehicle of the Buddhist teachings called the Mahayana, which is uh, it's described as, as the big wheel. And the, the Buddhist teachings compared to an eightfold path, there's your eight folds. Uh, then they announced about 50 BC. Uh, well, now we have a higher wheel of the Buddhist teachings called the Mahayana. So this is something new. I think this is about 400 years after the Buddha, some books say 500 years. Um, so, uh, of course, the Theravadins and uh, the similar schools, and even the Masagika said, well, um, uh, where'd you get that? I mean, uh, we, we haven't seen this in the last 400 years. We haven't seen these higher teachings of the Buddha. Uh, we uh, doubt the authenticity of your uh, teachings there in the Mahayana. Uh, where did it come from? And so what they explain, and you can get this from, you know, most of Mahayana centers in the world, they'll explain that, well, the Buddha in his lifetime on earth, he taught the Mahayana teachings, which are higher teachings. And um, he didn't give them to human beings generally at that time uh, because um, he gave the, the Hinayana, the lower teachings called Hinayana. There's a, this is a term here, <laughs> lesser Hinayana. Um, and the Hinayana, Hin, Hinayana, they say, was teachings the Buddha gave for people with, with blunt faculties who couldn't get the higher teachings because they had blunt faculties. This is what's stated in the Mahayana scripture. So they say that the Buddha in his lifetime on earth, he taught the Mahayana to the devas, you know, the heavenly beings. I should describe it the term deva. This is a term for, for, for an angel. Um, and then uh, around 50 BC, uh, these Mahayana teachings were channeled down from the devas to Nargarjuna, who was a saint who lived in India, and the, the Mahayanas kind of adopted him as a Mahayana saint. Although Nargarjuna himself wasn't actually a Mahayana, so he was sort of in between the Theravada schools and the Mahayana, kind of trying to make a bridge. He's very well respected. So after his death, they decided that uh, Nargarjuna got the revealed teachings. And the Buddha, in his wisdom, did this so that the uh, Teachings would be prevented from slipping in to decline, to revivify the doctrine. And they even explain, you know, how did Nargarjuna go about getting these teachings? They say, well, the devas gave it to him, or perhaps uh, uh, Nagas uh, gave it to Nargarjuna. Nagas uh, lived in subterranean caves underwater. Because Nagas is a type of deva, the Buddha described, which is serpent like, like the Loch Ness monster, or here in British Columbia, the Ogopogo monster. And, uh, 
Okanag Lake, which is true from Buddhist view, it's likely a Naga. So Nagas were known. So they said, well, the, the Nagas got it there and there were subterranean caves underwater and then they gave it to Nagarjuna. So that's where we have uh, Tibetan Buddhism coming from today and Zen and Pure Land Buddhism in the Orient, the Mahayana school. So that's the official story. Uh, now the Theravans would say, well, it's uh, certainly possible that the Devas, even today, could channel down teachings that the Buddha gave them, because the Buddha did indeed, according to suttas, he would spend months in, the, in heaven uh, teaching the devas. Um, the Buddha taught his mother, she was a deva in uh, Tushita heaven, and she kind of repaired down to Tawa Tim's heaven, heaven, heaven number two, I won't show you all the grass, but um, she died uh, a week after the Buddha was born, Buddha so he was a really good son, and he spent three months uh, one of his early first, uh, first or second retreat, rainy seasons, and he taught his mom and the millions of devas the Dhamma. This is true from a Theravadan perspective. So the Maya say, well, the Buddha had all these teachings channeled down from devas, so, uh, well, the way we analyze this from a Theravadan school, we don't just say, well, that's not true, that can't be possible. You know, the Buddha stated, taking the Buddha's advice, he said, in the future, if people claim to be teaching my doctrine, you shouldn't immediately re reject what they teach or, or accept it, but first you should compare, carefully compare it to the suttas and, and the vinaya. So the suttas, the discourses, and the vinaya is like the rules of discipline for the monks, rules of ethics. And the Buddha said if, it's, um, if it contradicts the suttas and the vinaya, then you should, uh, you should reject it. But if it's in harmony with the suttas and the vinaya, then you should accept it and follow it. So based upon this, the Theravadins decide the, the Mahayana is uh, not the teachings of the Buddha, this is another doctrine that's alien to the Buddha's teachings. And the Theravadins decided that uh, the Mahayana contradicts the Buddha. It's not just something different, not just something added on to it, like a few extra techniques, but it's contradictory. So the Theravadin elders, as well as the other 11 schools, they all decide to renounce the Mahayana. And their advice to you, their ancient advice, is that you should renounce the Mahayana. So that's your typical Theravadan attitude today in Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, all the monks are trained, they, they know about this. It's similar with the, the Catholics and the Protestants, like the, the Catholics have a very thorough analysis of the Protestants, their views and what's wrong with it, and why the Catholics are better. And the Protestants have a very thorough anal analysis, critique of the Catholics, and why the Protestants are better. And this is what scholars do, that's, that's their job. <laughs> Especially if you're on one side or the other. So the Theravadins and the Mahayanas for many centuries, they thoroughly analyze each other and they can uh, you know, analyze the deficiencies of the, of the Mahayana. So that's the, the early history. Um, and then things sort of branched out uh, from there. Yes. Brian, you said so there were seven Terra schools. Yeah. Um, but you said that... No, no, uh, 11. Oh, 11. Yeah, the, the seven were the Mahas and Gikas. Oh, okay. Um, but you, I think you said that there wasn't much difference doctrinally between the Terra schools. That's true. So were the differences um, purely geographical, like in terms of them having you know different names and only the ten? Oh no, they the split from each other. Often they would split over just tiny pieces of doctrine, over views, analysis, or over some pieces of dharma. Yeah. But often, you know, the, the, the monks would often stay in each other's temples. Even Masagika monks would stay in Theravadan temples. You know, they, they got along pretty well. They functioned pretty well. They were that far apart. Yeah, so, so the, the, they still had the same teachings of the Buddha. But what really changed in terms of um, the, the Buddha's suttas was the Mahayana sutras. So the word sutra, this is just a, the... Uh, running out of space here. So the Mahayana, Mahayana said sutras, because the word from, from Sanskrit translates as sutras, the Pali we say, you know, suttas. But what the Mahayanas did, um, in order to prop up the new doctrine, there's something different. And that's to kind of establish themselves. So they, um, they wrote about uh, 10 to 15,000 pages of um, uh, new and approved discourses of the Buddha which are certainly regarded by scholars as a counterfeit. Uh, so this is problematical. <laughs> Not only that, like, um, 
So if you, you know, read a Buddhist text, you know, if it's Mahayana, you're quoting the Buddha, you can't really be sure the Buddha said that unless you cross-reference it with the Pali Suttas. So this is a disconcerting. Like, we have about 6,000 pages, right, of the, of the Buddha's words in the Theravada Pali. Well, the Mahayana have about, depending on the size of the book, uh, 10 to 15,000 pages of counterfeit discourse, like the Diamond Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, the Adamasaka Sutra, some of these famous sutras. Um, and, you know, scholars really know that this, these are written from about 50 BC to 800 AD, so obviously it couldn't have been from the Buddha. But your average Mahayana student in an Asian country might not know that. In fact, many, many don't. They take it as the word of the Buddha. Uh, so that's problematical. In fact, the Buddha prophesies this in the counterfeit of the true Dhamma Sutta. There it is right there. In the Buddha's words, he prophesies it in the future. This is what's going to happen. So I'll actually read for you the Buddha's words on this. It's really quite chilling if you really contemplate upon this. So here we go. This is the counterfeit of the true Dhamma Sutta in the, in the connected discourses of the Buddha, which is the Samyutta Nikaya, probably. This was translated by uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. Um, it's the Buddha's chilling prophecy about the rise of the Mahayana, although he didn't use that name. So this sutta is found in chapter 5 of the connected discourses with Kasapa. Uh, Kasapa is the, the uh, senior disciple of the Buddha at the time of the Buddha's death. So he was like the de facto leader at the time. Um, so Mahakasapa asked the Buddha why there are more and more training rules but fewer bhikkhus are established in final knowledge. So the Buddha said, so the Buddha saying this to Kasapa. He says, uh, well, that's the way it is, Kasapa. When beings are deteriorating and the true Dhamma is disappearing, there are more training rules, but fewer bhikkhus are established in final knowledge. Kasapa, the true Dhamma does not disappear so long as the counterfeit of the true Dhamma has not arisen in the world. Um... But when a counterfeit dhamma arises in the world, then the true dhamma disappears. Just as kasapa, gold does not disappear so long as counterfeit gold has not arisen in the world. But when counterfeit gold arises, then true gold disappears. So the true dhamma does not disappear so long as the counterfeit of the true dhamma has not arisen in the world. But when a counterfeit of the true dhamma arises in the world, then the true dhamma disappears. So... He actually carries on a bit further. He says here, further down, he says, Here are bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, these are nuns, uh, lay male followers, female lay followers. They, when they dwell without reverence and deference towards a teacher, so he describes this is how things will deteriorate in the future. So he says, It's not the earth element, kasapa, that causes the true dhamma to disappear, nor the water element, or the heat element, or the air element. It is the senseless people who arise right here who cause the true Dhamma to disappear. The true Dhamma does not disappear all at once in the way a ship sinks. So he's very good similes, the Buddha gave us. Now, Naraka Sapa, five detrimental things that lead to the decay and disappearance of the true Dhamma. What are the five? Like I was saying before, here are the bhikkhus, the bhikkhunis, the male lay followers, the female lay followers dwell without reverence and deference towards the teacher. Next, they dwell without reverence and deference towards the Dhamma. They dwell without reverence and deference towards the Sangha. So the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, his teachings in the community. They dwell without reverence and deference towards the training. And they dwell without reverence and deference towards concentration, like a meditation. So they're not following the training and they're not meditating. And then he says, Buddha says, these kasapa are the five detrimental things that lead to the decay and disappearance of the true Dhamma. Uh, so, um, what this what it means is that the Terras at that time, the Theravadins, felt that the rise of the Mahayana was the beginning of the end. Many would remark, wow, just like he prophesied, like 500 years after the Buddha, I think one of the commentaries said he, uh, he said, I'm not sure if the Buddha said it would be 500 years after his time. So they're saying, wow, the Buddha and his wisdom, you know, he knew this was going to happen. And look, here's, there's the Mahayana. It's happening. It's all falling apart now. This is the beginning and the end. <laughs> Just like he told us. So the Theravadan attitude is one of uh, 
sort of equanimity or balance or patience to this. So Theravadins tend not to engage so much with the Mahayana because um, before the Buddha's death, like just actually as he was dying, he said that the highest penalty is to ignore. So we don't have capital punishment in, in Buddhism. The highest penalty is to ignore. So generally the Theravadins just ignore the Mahayana. How do you use that approach in your own life? Huh? How do you do that yourself? If you have a neighbor who's making a racket next door, do you just ignore it? Uh, or how, do you, how does it apply in a practical way? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, the Buddha, he, he was uh, pr- pronounced that particular in the sense to um, China. One of the monks was quite arrogant because he, uh, he was with Prince Siddhartha when he fled the palace. He was like his charioteer. So China was a bit egotistical about his close association with the Buddha. And it's great arrogance. So the Buddha told Ananda to uh, pronounce the highest penalty. To go to Chan and say, you know, the highest penalty has been pronounced by your Chan. We're all going to ignore you. So uh, it had the desired effect. He, he uh, softened up, became humble. He improved and he got enlightened. And they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> but in the example I'm using, if you, yeah, don't, yeah. if you don't tell your neighbor, then they just don't know there's a problem. Well, um, you don't have to pronounce the highest penalty on your neighbor. You can actually go and talk to them or <laughs> contact no, them. Yeah. So they didn't just ignore yeah. it. They said, we're going to ignore you from now on. Yeah. Yeah. Giving them a heads up to yeah, ignore. Yeah. So you, <laughs> in your, uh, you're at the bank and the teller is rude. Uh, are you able to let water off the duck's back or, or do you call people out? Or Well, you know, I, I think it always depends on the situation. Like maybe you can just let it go or maybe you should speak to her, her manager, you know. You might have to sort things out, say what is what, depending on the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I don't have to do another two hours of history. That was sort of the first five centuries. So this gives you an idea, at least so, to, to about uh, checking out authenticity. And you can always Google, just Google Buddhist history and get the dates of schisms. It's good to know. So are you saying the Ma, sorry, I can't pronounce Ma it. Ma Sangikas. The, hmm? the uh, Ma Hayans? Ma Sangikas, yeah. Are they, is that still practiced today now? Uh, no. Um, they've been extinct since about 1200 AD because uh, a Muslim invasion from Turkey came in about 1197 AD and totally wiped out Buddhism completely from India. Were you saying Mahayana or Mahasangika? Yeah, I meant Mahayana. Oh, yeah, no, Mahayana is uh, perhaps the majority of Buddhists in the world today. Oh. I'd say it's about 60% of the world is Mahayana today, 40% Theravada. But I'm concerned about, you know, you, what's going to happen to you like in this course? In this city, it's probably about 70% Mahayana or 75% Mahayana, you know, 25% Theravada. I'm one of the very few people in the entire city teaching Theravadan Buddhism in English, other than the ethnic Theravadans. So Maya includes Tibetan, which is the dominant form of Buddhism in the West, you know, because of the diaspora, the Tibetan people in 1959. They, you learn how to speak English with India. And, and Zen is the second most popular. So it's a, it's a concern um, for, for you if you want to continue your Buddhist studies. That's why uh, it's good for you to know. Of course, you know, you you got to make your own choice. I don't expect you actually to, to believe what I say. You should properly things cross reference it. YouTube makes it easier, and Google you can look up all kinds of stuff. Well, I think the problematic thing for the the Mahayana is um, because they weren't around the time of the Buddha. Like Theravadins have no reference to the Mahayana in their scriptures, right? There's no reference except this prophecy. But unfortunately, for the Mahayana, in order to be a higher wheel, or to be a big wheel, right? Somebody's got to be a little wheel. So they, they use the term Theravada, with, I mean, they use the term Hinaya for the Theravada. So Hinaya is a derogatory term. It's generally translated as lesser wheel, uh, and they call themselves a higher wheel. However, uh, that's the polite translation, the real translation. You can listen to Ashan Brahm in YouTube videos. He says the term Hina means a vile, disgusting, <laughs> repulsive vehicle. So this is the Mahana description of the Theravada. Of course, they'll say, um, the, the term Hinayana came at that time, this was in northern India, right? And there's one particular school, not the Theravadans, we were in, we were in Sri Lanka. There's another school, and they're criticizing particularly just the Abhidharma aspect of that school, which is like a basket of scripture, and they call it the Hinayana. So they could argue, well, we don't mean the Theravada, you know, when we say Hinayana. 
But the way they use the term Hinayana includes today the whole of the Theravada. That's how it's used. Of course, some, some people are much more polite now. Even since the 1990s, my you know, some uh, Maya are getting more polite about the term. But what's important about, about their scriptures is built right into their scriptures that criticize the uh, Hinayana. And the basic criticism is that the Hinayanas are, are, are selfish because they don't want to get enlightened for themselves. They say the Mahayana, the emphasis is more on compassion, the Bodhisattva vow to help others, and the Theravadins are selfish. Because we have the Arahant ideal, which is the, 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 the view and the goal of the Theravada is to follow the Eightfold Path and get enlightened, be an Arahant. Whereas the view and the goal in the Mahayana is a different view and a different goal. <laughs> Their view is the uh, Bodhisattva vow, which is the vow of compassion that you forgo your own enlightenment in favor of the enlightenment of others, try to help others to enlightenment. And you take a vow that when you die, you'll keep coming back to help others to get enlightened. You keep doing this for almost forever until everyone's enlightened. And uh, the goal is to, you know, to do that. And they actually have a different nirvana than the Theravada. Now, that's a bit confusing because... Uh, uh, in the Theravada teachings, nirvana transcends samsara, samsara is psychic existence, and nirvana is beyond and separate. But the Mahayana have a view which from a... You can read a good essay by Bhikkhu Bodhi on this, called Dhamma and Non-Duality. It's on my website at theravada.ca. He says the view of the Mahayana is outrageous from a Theravada perspective. Their view is that samsara and nirvana are inseparable, that nirvana is within samsara. Um, which is what I believed for many, many years, because I started off as a Mahayana. So I had to unlearn all this kind of stuff. So it goes on and on. So um, it's uh, deliberately made to be obfuscated. It's, uh, so uh, very few people will, will just give you the straight goods on uh, what I just told you. Very, very hard. Maybe for, this will be the last time in your entire lives you'll ever hear anyone straight to your face <laughs> tell you what I just said. <laughs> because, you know, people want to be polite. You know, unless you have any questions, comments, I guess there's a lot to lay on. But you know, I, I did a few as a, I guess, uh, to inoculate you, to protect you, in case you miss the next week's class, you know, to know a bit about history. Well, of course, it can be a downer if you get into it for too long. So I'm home now. I've got my tea. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is um, Buddhist theory about uh, Mahayana. Buddhism. I got this, uh, the first time I met Ashan Sona, actually, in the uh, year 2000, he was giving me a talk on the uh, <clears throat> difference between Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism, largely to a group of Laotian, Thais, and other Theravadans. He said, um, one of the root problems with the Mahayana is that they don't respect our hunts. Uh, you know, it's all through their, their scriptures, basically, that they regard our hunts as selfish, they only want to get light for themselves, they don't have enough compassion for others, and so forth. I mean, this is what, what's in the Mahayana view. Um, maybe some schools of thought today don't have that view, but it's basically pervasive in the Mahayana. So he said, 2,000 years of not respecting arhats within the Mahayana resulted karmically in communism. And when he said this, the, the hair just rose in the back of my neck because I realized what he meant. He said that... Um, Communism is a particular ideology where uh, it says uh, religion is the opium of the people, Karl Marx stated. Actually, I think uh, his mentor, Moses Hess, actually wrote the Communist Manifesto. But it's an um, ideology that specifically picks on religion. And throughout 2,000 years of Buddhism in China, there's various kings and dynasties. And uh, you know, sometimes the Buddhist kings would persecute the Taoists, or a Taoist king would persecute the Buddhists, but none of these kings were like Chairman Mao. Chairman Mao destroyed during the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976 500,000 Mahayana Buddhist temples. He wiped out half a million Mahayana Buddhist temples, drove the monks and nuns out, countless were, were killed. So this could be regarded as a, as a karmic resultant of 2,000 years of not respecting arhats. If you don't believe in, in karma, or if you don't have a Buddhist view, you could explain it in human terms and say, well, Mao, this was his idea, the Cultural Revolution, and he picked on religion. That was just his, his decision. Um, but from a karmic view, when big things happen like that, they're, 
they're very likely or almost always uh, some large karmic resultant of uh, individual karmas of a large group of people. So this could be could be seen in this way, because there's Mahayana Buddhism that was destroyed by communism, but not Theravada Buddhism. Theravada countries like Burma, Thailand, Sri Lanka were basically spared communism, except for Cambodia, which was uh, attacked by uh, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger with the secret bombings of Cambodia, which destabilized the country and led to the rise of Pol Pot and communism. Other than that exception, <clears throat> Laos, Laos was communist and is also Theravada Buddhist, but it wasn't harmed too bad. I mean, I mean, the still Theravada Buddhism still survived there. So you have about 100 million people in the Theravada world spared ravages of communism at that the time, whereas communism engulfed not only um, China, but Mongolia, which was Buddhist, Russia, which was partly Buddhist, North Korea, and Vietnam, all Mahayana countries where Mahayana was devastated by communism. So um, this reflection on karma, understanding of karma, gives you a deeper interpretation of a world events, another way of, of seeing things. Now, it's hard to prove that this is true. This is a theory. Um, I can't say I know. I don't know. But it is a theory. It's something to consider. So we're not just talking about the differences between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. We're talking about millions of dead people. And uh, according to law of karma, this could likely happen again in the future, but probably in some other form. So, next video. Now I'll talk about a disturbing theory which many Theravada monks believe. And that is the theory that Mara made Mahayana. I'll read um, some passages from my book, um, Freeing the Buddha, from page 380 to 392, where I really lay the history bare. And this is, this is red hot section of the book. So it begins on page 380 with this section right here. So, it says, um, criticism is le legitimate and necessary if we are to represent the teachings of the historical Buddha as he wishes us to. The only hypothesis which explains the big picture of the whole Buddhist religion is that Mara made Mahayana. Mahayana. This is the final and ultimate truth about Mahayana Buddhism, according to this theory. The general theory of relativity in Buddhism. It cannot possibly be any worse than this. This is a terrible possibility to consider, but this issue is so important that our logic must be based upon perfectly valid reasoning. So, I'll read an account here from um, the Samidya sect. They claim that Mara was at the, um, at the early schisms in Buddhism prior to the Mahayana. Now, Mara, I should describe, is um, in Buddhist cosmology, he's a, he's a deva in the sixth heaven of the sensuous sphere. In fact, I'll show you the illustration in my second book, A Short Walk on an Ancient Path, a Buddhist Exploration of Meditation, Karma, and Rebirth. Um, so in the cosmology of this, the sensuous sphere, on the sixth heaven, which is the highest heaven of the sensuous sphere we have right here, um, you can see this is where the devas delight in the power of creation over others. And Mara is on, lives on the outskirts of the sixth heaven of the center sphere. Mara is not the ruler. He doesn't rule over the heaven. He's on the outskirts. So his main function in Buddhist cosmology is to prevent people from getting enlightened, to trip them up, to tempt them with fame, money, power, sex, anything, to keep them plugged into the world of the senses. Um, the Buddha had 16 personal encounters with Mara. So Mara is a personal being, a deva. This other concepts of Mara, like Mara could be like greed, hatred, and delusion within you, the Maras. But Mara is a real being in, that, in the Buddhist view. So, um, um, 
Buddhists are always on alert for Mara, who's up to his tricks again. So um, after the Buddha's passing, about 137 years after the Buddha, we have this account. I'll read this for you. Um, Mara initiated the schism in the religion about 116 or, by another account, 137 years after the Buddha, when uh, Mahadeva turned against the Arhats. So the Samidya tradition was one of the 18 early schools similar to the Theravada. In History of Religions, Nature and Prebish write this, and from 1976, they state, In the Samidya account, the schism was provoked by Mara himself, who transforms himself into a man described as Badra, good, or possessing all good qualities, taking on the robes of a monk, Mara teaches various supernormal powers, city, and with his teaching of the five propositions, creates great dissension in the Buddhist community. As a result, the Sangha is divided into the sects of the Staviras and the Mahasangikas. This account has some details not found in the Savastivardhan sources, supplying, for instance, the names of two monks, Naga and Theramatta, who accepted and praised the five points. Even during the time of the Buddha, there were monks being influenced by Mara. So Mara is real, and Mara is, in this, in this uh, case, you know, took on human form, wore the robes of a monk, and he, he was a charismatic leader, and he led this revolt against the monks with the, the five points. You know, the monks were no good. So um, with, with that knowledge in place, with the rise of the Mahayana around 50 B.C., it's uh, not a great stretch for many Theravada monks to believe that, you know, Mara's up to his old tricks again. Mara's created a Mahayana. Look at the whole elaborate scope of the Mahayana. We know it's you know, the Mahayana Sutras, the, the discourses are counterfeit discourses of the Buddha. There's no scholarly debate about that. So to create ten to 15,000 pages of false discourse of the Buddha, that could be attributed to, um, to Mara. I would say... Um, Personally, I don't know. I can't say with certainty. I can't actually say what I believe in the sense that I don't really know what to believe. I'm just weighing the evidence. But I certainly state it as a fact that it's possible that Mara made Mahayana. In December of the year 2000, I received this you know, visual impression. I wouldn't call it... A, a vision, but the strong visual image of uh, two light bulbs. One's a clear light bulb, but one's frosted white. So the clear light bulb represents um, the, the Pali Suttas, the Theravadan tradition. The filament represents the, the actual discourse of the Buddha and the light shining out clearly. Whereas the frosted light bulb represents the Mahayana, where the light is frosted, so it actually looks brighter in a way. It looks more attractive. But inside that frosted light bulb, is the layer of black that you can't see, a thin layer of black. So this represents um, the sort of the, the, the force of Mara, the black side, that you can't see, but it looks good, it looks bright. So after this realization with my light bulbs, I, I decided to seek a higher authority. I contacted um, a monk to get his views on it. Um, and. Uh, this is it. I'll just write from my book, um, page 383 of Bring the Buddha. Um, so he wrote back to me and said, uh, Brian, I have spent uh, some years considering the Mahayana matter. I have many opinions about the historical motivations as well as the psychological motivations of the Mahayana school. Read the Katavatu of the Abhidhamma. These are concise and sometimes cryptic. Discussions of 500 points of controversy argued out between the Theravada and other schools, including the Mahayana. After that period, which could be as late as 300 AD, there is no formal reply to the various developments in the Mahayana and Pure Land sects from the Theravada school. As well, if you read the early history of Buddhism passed down in Sri Lanka in the Mahavamsa and the Kulavamsa, you will see the clear reference to the Mahayana as fulfilling the prophecy by the Buddha that the sasana ends not by direct oppression, but by counterfeit dhamma. 
Their main motivations for many doctoral developments were clearly competition with the Theravada, as they had to gather supporters after the schism at the Second Council. The ten controversial points are absolutely bizarre and have had strange ramifications for the Mahayana ever since. This area of a critique of the Mahayana needs thorough research and careful strategy in order to make beneficial statements. Criticism is legitimate and necessary if we are to represent the teachings of the historical Buddha as he wishes to. So, there you have it. So, uh, I once asked a monk, is it true that uh, Mara made Mahayana? And he turned to me very calmly and said, many monks believe that. I even asked them, is it true that the Mahayana is evil? And he replied calmly, that's the mainstream Theravada view. So I should at this point say that um, Mahayana people are fine and they're, most of them are sincere and practicing what they're that what they want to practice, but I feel that they're being misled, and certainly Theravadans feel that they're being misled. So, food for thought. <laughs>